Hello, everybody. My name is Monica Riccosi. Welcome to the Fashion and Sustainability Summit. The 2020 series is a collaboration of FashionDex and LIM College. The summit is sponsored by Ecolife North, Endor Textiles Limited, and the Accessories Council. Questions are welcome today. During the presentation, please type your questions in either the Q&A or the chat box. There's no need to type in both. Questions will be read to speakers during the last 30 minutes of today's discussion. The raised hand feature is utilized for paid on-screen attendees only. Uh, in a minute, we'll be having a conversation on helping brands lower their impact. This is week two. We have Karen Giberson of the Accessories Council. We have Lewis Perkins from the Apparel Impact Institute, Sarah Kozlowski from CFDA, and Esther Chachi from the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. Today's lead moderator is our very own Andrea Kennedy of FashionDex and LIM College, as well as co-moderators Riley Bott and Rebecca Margolis, both of LIM College. And with that being said, I would like to now turn the series over to our lead moderator. Andrea, please take it away. Monica and welcome everyone to week two of the Fashion and Sustainability Summit. I'm Andrea Kennedy and uh, do work at Fashion Dex as well as teach in the sustainability minor courses at LIM College and thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to welcome Karen Guyverson, Sarah Kozlowski, Esther Chichai, and Lewis Perkins and now I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves. So who wants to start? Good. So my name is Lewis Perkins, and I've been working in the apparel sector for the part of the last 10 years, but working in uh, product sustainability for, for about 15 years. And um, our organization, Apparel Impact Institute, is focused on scaling solutions that are either proven or need to be generated in order to help brands and manufacturers meet their environmental goals. And so I know that um, between Esther and myself, we'll be talking a little bit also about this ecosystem that we belong to, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, which we rolled out of um, in, in alignment with the HIG tools, where um, the coalition of, of brands and retailers who are really focusing on reaching environmental targets around climate, water stewardship, chemistry, materials, and how um, we can identify the right programs and hotspots where we can um, fund and scale initiatives. So AII was generated um, rolling out of the SAC as an interested group of brands and philanthropic partners who wanted to see those programs come to life, really from a data-driven science-based perspective, be able to check the box on impact solutions that we're actually achieving and report that back to the industry. Everyone, my name is Esther Chichai. I'm the manager of member engagement here at the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. And SAC is, uh, it's an industry organization where the apparel, footwear, and textile industry is leading alliance for sustainable production. And what we do, as Lewis mentioned, is that we convene members of the industry to develop and scale the Hig Index, which I'll be talking about a lot today. And the Hig Index is a suite of tools that provide standardized measurements of environmental and social impact across the global value chain. So in my role, I'm lucky enough to work directly with SAC members in the Americas region where we have over 100 leading brands, retailers, manufacturers, and other affiliate members connected to the industry. So I work with these member companies to scale up the usage and the impact of the HIG index in their value chain, and to also deepen their connection with the work and the community of the SAC. So we do that by finding opportunities for connection to other members, knowledge sharing, uh, best practices sharing, and other forms of pre-competitive collaboration so we can all move the industry forward together. Great to be here today. Hi, I'm Karen Guyberson, and I am the president of the Accessories Council, which is a not-for-profit trade association. Uh, we're about 27 years old with almost 350 members, companies of all sizes and categories, pretty much everything but the clothes. So from your head, hats, hair accessories, um, now we have our new PPE category, which is hot with our masks and scarves and, um, you know, legwear all, all the way down. 
everyone, and thank you to LAM and Sebastian Dex. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Sarah Kozlowski. I'm the Director of Education and Sustainability Initiatives at the CFDA, um, which I've been uh, part of the team for almost six years, but have 27 years background in fashion, uh, first uh, decade as a designer and then as a former educator. Um, our organization is also not-for-profit. Uh, we have over 480 of the leading uh, American fashion uh, talents that you can possibly imagine, from Virgil Abloh to Ralph Lauren. Uh, we're led by Chairman uh, Mr. Tom Ford and CEO President Stephen Cole. And since we were founded in 1962, our mission has for a very long time been rooted in mentorship and education. Uh, the programs that my team and I oversee really encompass everything from scholarship to sustainability, and that includes um, student support, graduate talent support, early emerging business development, um, micro award combined with mentorship support uh, through uh, both member and other SME brands. So we're very lucky to have a kind of wide perspective on how sustainability and innovation and creativity, you know, really from a design perspective, uh, really hold potential to advance, um, help us overcome some of the critical issues we're facing today. Thank, thank you all, four of you, for being here today. I love that you're a director of education, Sarah, because that's the mission of our summit every year is education for sustainability, specifically in fashion. So I'm, it's great to have an, an educator on board. Well, you're all educators. Um, so all four of you actually work with leading brands. And if you are a brand and watching right now, and, um, and they're wondering, I know you've each said what you do at your organizations, but specifically, since this is the Fashion and Sustainability Summit, how can you work, how do you work with these leading brands? And um, how can you work with any brand specifically to reduce their impacts and achieve sustainability. I, I, we also at Fashion Dex work with a lot of brands and you know, so many don't even know where to start. So let's talk about that. How can, you work, how can a brand work with you towards achieving sustainability? Uh, so as our name indicates, uh, sustainability is really baked into the DNA of the SAC as is working with brands and bringing everybody together so I guess just for a bit of context, it might help to know uh, SAC was established in 2009 as a collaboration between Walmart and Patagonia, who put out a call to industry leaders to come together, collaborate, and to develop a shared language for sustainability measurement and improvement that didn't really exist at the time. So because that didn't exist, the industry was not moving forward on sustainability improvements in a unified way. And so the SAC set out to develop this shared language so brands could improve their impact together. So today, the shared language is known as the Hig Index, and uh, in short, it's a suite of five tools that empower brands, retailers, manufacturers to measure their environmental and social uh, sustainability impacts across a variety of areas. And at the SAC, we help guide our members as they start using the tools, identifying improvement areas, and scaling this work to drive systemic change together. So currently we work with over 250 member companies worldwide, uh, many that you're all likely familiar with, to not only increase adoption of the HIG Index globally, but also to deepen the entire industry's commitment to equal partnership, transparency, collaborative goal setting across the value chain, and again, to do this in a collaborative manner. This is Lewis, should I follow on as sort of the continuation of that narrative? Match, that makes sense. So building on what Esther said, so a few key brands as leaders of the SAC saw the opportunity to actually work together in a collective action approach on specific disruptions or interventions around best practices to, to actually drive uh, impact solutions. And so AII was formed out of that target uh, Gap Inc, PVH, uh, were the first to come on board, but there's also a number of legacy brands that have been working with programs like Clean by Design, which many of you may be familiar with that uh, was launched under the NRDC, and other mill improvement work. So the way that we work is we're not a membership, but we're an aggregator of corporate sustainability budgets, 
plus work streams. So rather than go after a supply chain, which is not vertically integrated, we, uh, you know, we as an industry or they as an industry are sharing the supply chain. So let's go at these projects together. And so what we, we do, the way in which we work with brands is we develop a roadmap around what types of programs and projects we can achieve. I mentioned the Clean by Design, that's an energy efficiency, resource efficiency program that can yield up to 10% carbon reductions in the wet processing. 20% water savings and has a economic return on investment back to the mill. But that's just the beginning. And we know that whether it's getting off coal, implementing new innovations around digestive boilers or biomass conversion from coal to some other form, we know that just in tier two wet processing, there's a tremendous amount of new work that needs to be done. So the way that we work with the brands, and we have about 20 now that are working with us and other industry groups like SAC, of course, and then OIA, who's working with us in partnership too. We're doing a, a luxury collaborative. We're looking at in Italy right now too. So we work with different pockets and groups to bring together their common goals. If you have a shared supply chain and you've stated some objectives around water, energy, carbon, then we should do it together rather than individually. And that's, that's the whole imp, um, sort of way in which we work. So we help kind of play the role of intellectual clearinghouse of good projects and partners that are out there. So we can almost like an investment portfolio say, hey, these are proven good players, good actors, let's go scale their programs. Or this one seems good, but it's missing a few key pieces. Let's focus in on what it would take to scale that particular project. And if it fits or aligns with other programs, let's start looking at this as a comprehensive continuous improvement roadmap. So a facility doesn't feel like they're getting hit up by a thousand recruitments from different brands with their own pet projects. It's all brought under sort of a, a playbook or roadmap that aligns towards science-based targets, UN charter for fashion, fashion pact. I mean, it should all be driving towards the same common goals. So that's great. So Sarah and Karen, you're, you work less to measure, right? And on those roadmaps, so well, CFDI a little bit, but let's talk about how you work with brands in terms of sustainability. I'll start. Um, I would say that we are embarking on a sort of a new chapter for sustainability initiatives at the CFDA, which actually opened last year when we launched our open access platform on CFDA.com, which we dubbed the Sustainability Resource Hub. Um, but over the last really 10 years, the CFDA has really tried to uh, embed, uh, again, from an education uh, stance, support to, you know, whether it's students or, or CFDA members around sustainability and growth, uh, going back to the Eco Challenge, which was a partnership established with Lexis that really helped create benchmarks around material and production uh, goals. But um, very lucky and fortunate um, within one key program that grew uh, as a succession to the Eco Challenge, uh, the fashion initiative actually to work with amazing experts such as Lewis. Um, the fashion initiative over its three cohorts actually uh, aimed to really support um, quite bespoke approaches, uh, creation of blueprints that really integrated design strategy that were specific to the brand's ethos uh, alongside you know, some basic impact assessment and introduction to tools such as the HIG. Um, and I can say that you know, over that five-year period of the fashion initiative, really to see such an enormous catapult and level of knowledge from brands um, coming into the program uh, around eco-social literacy, around materials, um, but also seeing more access to those uh, resources and things that, you know, back in 2015 were almost impossible for a small brand to really get their hands on, you know, in terms of uh, material innovation uh, towards last year's final cohort with uh, public school being one of the five members in the cohort. And they were able to not only prototype, but go into production immediately post program with um, a proprietary recycled cotton uh, traditional cotton blend. So, but you know, um, as Lewis said, a lot of it is is one and one, and it really comes down to prioritization of goals. Uh, so we do use uh, various frameworks, including the UN SDGs. Um, and I would say that sort of an example of the kind of curriculum that we applied in that program on CFDA.com is available in our Sustainable Strategies Toolkit, uh, which we created in partnership with uh, Lauren Croak, who had many years background at Eileen Fisher. Um, and it, it you know, really, again, comes back to setting that GPS and that uh, framework of priorities of what is you know, attainable 
uh, to achieve in the short term, given the realities of the specific brands, uh, resources, and such. Because we deal with such diverse categories, uh, what we try to do is always have a universe of experts around us, people that we can refer to um, and connect our members with when they have questions or challenges. And, you know, sometimes it's all from, you know, from the start, you know, the factory, the materials, how they're making it. And sometimes it's simply, you know, they're working in uh, a material or fabrication that isn't yet uh, sustainable or doesn't have a, a direct answer today, because we kind of think it's, um, sustainability is a journey. <laughs> it's not a destination. It's constantly evolving, constantly new information. So uh, we just try to keep people like you <laughs> in our universe and, you know, have the, the helpline to send them to um, when questions come up. And, you know, it, sometimes it might just be we're going to make our office greener now and or our packaging. Um, so having those resources on hand is um, what we try to always do. Thanks, Karen. You're right. Sustainability is a journey and um, it's going to take a long way, long time to make the change, the true turnaround that needs to happen, but it's urgent and we need to start. And we know that it's urgent because the UN IPCC report came out two years ago saying that by first by 2050, now by 2040, we really need to get to net zero, right? To avoid the, the, the terrible impacts that are possibly forecasted for climate change from all the scientists that are part of the UN IPCC, which if you don't know is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And then Sarah, you also brought up the UN's SDGs, which if you don't know are the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. But let's go back to the UN IPCC again, and they have those specific climate goals. So I know the climate crisis is on your radar because we've already, I've heard a little bit about climate, energy, getting off of coal. You know, really we want to be fossil fuel free fashion in, in the future. So, um, but how can, how do you help brands who want to be more climate conscious? Because I feel like you know, five years ago, they were all looking for more material solutions. But now, because so many big brands have come out with actual climate action plans, they're on their website, how can a brand work to becoming more climate conscious? So I guess uh, one of the biggest things that we as SAC aim to communicate is that uh, being climate conscious is really just one step of the process. So our advice to brands who want to make any improvements is to really approach this holistically. So again, we're aiming to bring the whole industry together around a shared language, but every, every step of the value chain, ha chain has to be measured by that shared language. So uh, being climate conscious has to be considered at every step of the product life cycle, and it needs to result in action at every point in the value chain. So brands need to think about climate impacts holistically, beginning with the point of uh, which materials are selected, and then being completely aware of what the cradle to gate environmental impacts of the materials are. They also need to be aware of the impact of their product design, uh, the impact of their manufacturing processes, as well as pieces like packaging, transportation, distribution, retail environment, their office spaces, and also educating consumers on their own role and then staying accountable for all of this. So it sounds like a lot of work, but there are a lot of tools to help take care of this. So as I mentioned earlier, the HIG index is primarily how we help companies measure their holistic environmental impact. And to zero in on one part of it, our HIG brand and retail module asks brands and retailers to do things like map their entire supply chain so that they have full visibility into their partners, their processes, their impacts. And the BRM also helps to identify environmental and social risks, again, at every step of the process. So brands are able to zoom in on you know, deciding what their impact areas are, what their risk areas are, and then where in their entire ecosystem they need to be making improvements to have an impact. So uh, it is really a very holistic process. Yeah, I'll piggyback on that again. Uh, I think I think you'll see me and Esther talk a lot because we sort of we're, we're sort of tag teaming the same parts of an ecosystem. But I also want to speak a little bit to some of the things I've heard and learned at the CFDA and in, in the years that I've been working with Sarah and her team too, which is a lot of small medium enterprise or medium sized brands will say, how do I how do I approach this? Because 
because I'm a small brand. I don't have a huge supply chain. I don't have the um, leverage that, you know, Walmart and Target and Gap you're talking about have, you know, is there anything for me to do? And I think now in a current COVID-19 and soon maybe post COVID-19 environment where sustainability budgets may be restricted, restricted, you may have been 100% FTE working on sustainability and now to keep your job, you're going to 50% sustainability and 50% some other thing. And so resources and human capital is, is at a premium right now. And the answer, I think, to that question, too, is plug in. Plug into the SAC. Plug into the uh, CFDA because we're doing this in consortiums. We're doing this as groups. And if you are looking at the impact of your supply chain or you want to know it, there's a good chance you're sharing that with a larger player who is doing the analysis, who is pushing the facility environmental module, FEM, out there, who's working with AII on identifying and benchmarking certain facilities. And I think if, if there's anything I, I hope to get across today, it's sort of the collective action. Like, let's all do this together. So if you're listening and you're thinking I'm a small brand, but I want to plug into this, there's a, there's a great way in which you can work alongside some of the larger brands that are helping to do the heavy lifting. And I think potentially as we start to look at, you know, the, the top brands may drive the largest concentration of the supply chain from a from a capacity standpoint, we talk about sort of the 80, 20, and it depends on like 80% of the volume coming from 20% of the producers, or you can flip that and also say we have this 80% long tail of small manufacturers that we have a hard time identifying. But plugging into those two work streams, I think is a way in which, you know, brands can really get started um, and, and kind of leverage the work that's happening alongside them. I'd be interested to see Sarah's thoughts too, because I know this is something that comes up a lot with conversations that we've had at, at CFDA meetings with brands too, and, and designers. Absolutely, and I can't agree more. It's really about um, catalyzing collaboration. I think, you know, we really at the CFDA try to be facilitators uh, to access, whether that's towards expertise, such as the SAC and AI, or, um, you know, understanding what is out there, what's in the pipeline. And then in some cases, seeing little micro collaborations uh, you know, brand to brand. Uh, and I think of someone like Eileen Fisher, who naturally kind of forged that in a creative context, um, you know, working with, with someone like Mara Hoffman, or they actually also work with public school. Um, but I think, you know, in some ways, going back to that diagnostic prioritization phase of helping a brand craft a, a preliminary blueprint, um, there's a bit of a eval around trade-offs and sort of like, oh, it's not one or the other or either and, it's sort of like, how to navigate a set of complex choice. Uh, very often materials is of course the largest area of impact, but um, it's not enough to source the most, you know, uh, carbon neutral, you know, um, uh, or hopes to be carbon neutral material out there if you're shipping it, you know, along the way, you know, to 30 places and then working in a wholesale uh, model. So, you know, it, I think it comes back to the business model itself and the value creation and really looking at opportunities for you know, optimizing efficiency. Uh, the CFDA and Boston Consulting have been working together um, actually on a report tied to another part of the ecosystem, New York Fashion Week, that we'll be able to talk more about in the fall, but you know, because uh, transportation, whether it's in you know, product uh, you know, logistics or tied to events, um, clearly is, is a huge area and specific to events over the last few years we've seen a shift towards carbon buybacks i am not an expert on carbon buybacks but um, i learned a lot in the research phase of the work that we did this spring and and again it's it's not that easy so it's really about i think innovating you know your whole process your whole mindset and the models of what you're doing itself and i would finish by saying you know of course we're in an unprecedented time of challenge socioeconomically but i think we're also as many have said in the zeitgeist you know, at the precipice of a tremendous opportunity for transformation and this, this radical shift that we needed to have. And I'm very encouraged to see things such as, um, you know, the, the climate plan put forward by, you know, candidate Biden um, and to see that level of integration around um, innovation and economic transformation. So I think going back to fashion, uh, you know, it's that kind of mindset that can really make big leaps in an accelerated period of time going forward. I follow all that up. Um, but one thing I'll tell you that I'm seeing that's really exciting is, you know, we have a mix of very large companies who have budgets and teams that are dedicated to sustainability. 
But what makes me most excited and optimistic are the young and startup companies that we're seeing. And I'm sure Sarah, and you, you see it in your office. I know you see it because I've been you know, with you that from the get go, from the foundation of building, it's a principle that they are, um, re, you know, it's part of the DNA of how they're building their companies and their brands. So, um, you know, I, I'm just thrilled to see from the ground up, some of these companies really start to uh, take off. So it's not about changing, it's about, um, you know, insisting that they have a, a supply chain and that they are working in the best possible and greenest possible ways from the get go. So I'm quite optimistic about our new companies and the future that uh, our industries, uh, you know, what we're seeing. I'm glad you're optimistic. I am too. I, we because, but in, as teaching at a college, I speak to a lot of students who are in more of a state of despair. And I always say what Paul Hawken says is this is not a time of despair. This is a time of opportunity. And you talked about opportunity, Sarah, when you were saying it's a tremendous time for transformation. And it is. And innovation comes from desperation. So I am very uh, optimistic as well. I want to just define for everyone carbon neutral, who I think, Sarah, I think you talked about, you know, brands trying to get to carbon neutrality, but that is when, when you uh, assess your environmental, your footprint of your emissions, and then you work to reduce those and then balance by offsetting and, and get to zero. So carbon neutral means that everything you're doing that you you either reduce or offset to really have no carbon emissions in your production. So we're talking about the climate crisis and the climate crisis is a racial justice crisis. This, there's a big intersection between what's occurring in climate with environmental racism and the social justice issues that are happening across our country have been happening for years and years and years. And, we are not seeing change. And I wanna talk for a moment about the Black Lives Matter mo movement and equity and social justice. So if you could each talk about how in your organization you're trying to change the conditions in which our industry has allowed this to continue. I mean, look at our panel today. We're a, ma we're a majority of white people and this is embarrassing. So we need to change the conditions that put this system in place. So how are you doing that in your organizations? We are, um, we are actively promoting our, our black owned businesses. We're actively promoting and trying to support any of our minority owned businesses. Um, we have been doing it. Um, we're certainly doing it more actively right now. We're also looking at some different mentoring options for some of our companies who might need that little extra boost. And um, working with schools like LAM uh, to try to make sure that from the student level, we're offering paid internships. So the opportunities are um, there for everyone. And um, also, you know, anything that we can do to help coach with presentation skills, interview skills, um, and just trying to identify uh, candidates. We're also participating in a number of uh, panels and education sessions for our members um, to just bring more awareness to the opportunities that they have to have a more diverse workforce um, all the way through their organizations. Um, I think similarly to what Karen outlined at the Accessories Council, uh, both our chairman, Mr. Ford, and, and our CEO, Stephen Kolb, are, are working very hard. Uh, back in June, uh, we did release publicly a statement. Uh, we are very uh, actively developing a large set of expanded initiatives. Uh, we have had on our team, we're a very small team at the CFDA, we actually have about uh, 19 full-time staff, um, but we have had a dedicated social impact person uh, doing uh, various engagements and education uh, type of initiatives um, and some thought leadership work. But I, you know, can really say we are, uh, so fully committed working across all of our teams uh, following the board statement in June and we will be 
really activating uh, even deeper level of education support, um, similar to what Karen stated, you know, pipeline to hiring at all levels, and that includes uh, fellowships, you know, at the student and, and immediate graduate level through uh, mid-career. Um, but again, I think the community piece, engagement piece, and listening, and really having, especially now, um, everything is virtual engagement, but as much uh, open dialogue. Uh, and so we are still, I think, in a learning, listening uh, phase as to how we can, you know, build upon the work of the last few years. Uh, but uh, it is actually really top priority for our organization across all teams now. This, you know, this is a topic that um, I've been having some, some good conversations with my colleague, Amina Razvi, at the, who leads the SAC, the Sustainable Para Coalition, about the, the problem that exists with providing um, agency and connection points to the sustainability movement as a whole across a diverse pool of human beings in general, and that we live sometimes in, in sustainability, and maybe even in the fashion industry, we live in our own little echo chamber. And I think, speaking of someone who is generally in the Bay Area of California, I know the bubble and echo chamber I, I, I live in, and, and it's important that we get out of it and recognize that a couple of things, A, we all wear clothing, <laughs> we all breathe this air, we all benefit or, um, or don't benefit by the health and strength of this planet, which means that education and engagement and agency across all of our organizations has to start. This is not they have a problem, this is a we have a problem as a collective society. And then as our potential area of fashion and sustainability within fashion can be a reflection of that, um, and some of the discussions that we're having there are a lot of what I just heard from Sarah with CFDA is around, we've got to start changing the education and the um, access to this work from school levels. I mean, yes, certainly graduate schools and colleges, but maybe even sooner and earlier that we start to make this work uh, relevant and that we create avenues and pipelines for everybody to be able to plug in because this is a all hands on deck engagement and um, we need to kind of break down more of those uh, I guess I call them the echo chambers that we we only hear our own voices and we start to really ensure that we're we're listening you know and that we're also creating um, the job opportunities, the investment opportunities, you know, all the things that have been said by, by the other two on the panel. Uh, and that's something that AI very much wants to see happen too, because I also recognize that um, it, is, it is not always um, the, the people that are making and creating our apparel and traditionally have been doing that for hundreds of years are the most, um, exposed to environmental issues and, and the most in jeopardy to become, uh, you know, around water issues, around air quality issues, around human health, you know, that, so that's something that's extremely important as a whole as we look at this as a long-term sort of systemic uh, issue. And so I guess just to add to that, Lewis mentioned some of the conversations that have been uh, happening at SAC and that have been relevant to how SAC is approaching this. And we definitely agree that it's a very important question and agree that the industry and society has a lot of work to do. So it's really crucial that organizations like the Accessories Council, like CFDA are leading on raising up the voices of black professionals and professionals of color in this industry. And we hope to keep amplifying those as much as we possibly can through what we're doing. But it's also been a journey for us to look internally and see what kinds of internal conversations we can have with our own staff and to make sure that we're living out our values in internally before we can uh, do anything or say that we can lead anything externally. So looking at the values of putting people first and foremost that are so central to SAC, you know, when we think about our mission, we create tools that focus on promoting equal partnership within the industry, of uh, making sure that environmental justice is in place, of making sure that social and labor monitoring is providing more equitable conditions. And when we think too about how integral it is to SAC that we're bringing together the industry so that everybody has a voice in the conversation, we're really trying to think about how we can live out those values internally within our immediate staff, among our members, how we can have open dialogue, as Sarah mentioned, and how we can really be in a listening role and take that and make it impactful, and how we can learn from our broader membership and the industry to respond to needs and to adapt what we're doing based on what we're hearing. So across the board, we really wanna be actively listening so that we can grow and so we can leverage our internal values to make sure that they're supporting the industry equitably. Thank you all so much. I especially love that 
um, segment that we're a diverse pool of human beings. I, I mean, that's something we have to remember. We're all Earth citizens together in the same house, you know? So Black lives do matter and we are working on it. And so thank you so much. I wanna shift over because I'm seeing questions starting to come in. So um, Rebecca and Riley are both joining us as sustainability minor students at LAM College and they're gonna be reading your questions. So Rebecca, do you wanna start with one? I'd love to. Yeah. Um, I just wanna say thank you to everyone. This has been fabulous so far. I also very quickly just want to let you guys know as professionals, we, I am in touch with um, Nina, Nina Fidian Green at LIM and she's kind of in charge of all the internship stuff. So if anyone was interested in getting connected with that, as we talked about hiring and pipeline and diversity that way, um, let me know. She's great. She's all about paid internships and equity and she's fabulous. If anyone needs that contact, I have it. Um, first question from Travis. I hear a strong emphasis on the environmental pillar of sustainability. What steps have your organizations taken to assist fashion businesses address the social and gover governance pillars of ESG? Do you see a demand for this guidance? So maybe we've kind of discussed this, but maybe more of the governance aspect, if anyone wants to speak on that. Sorry, I'll speak to quickly. Um, again, going back to, you know, we, at basic level introduce sustainability or, or reference sustainability aligned to the 17 you know united nations sustainable development goals we are members of global compact and we use that utilize them you know in early ideation with the working one-on-one -on -one with brands um uh, we've even done workshops with educators often around you know isolating two to three specific goals but at, you know in broader sense always reminding uh founders that Sustainability is a combination of environmental, social, financial, and cultural, um, and organizational change, uh, organizational, you know, culture um, within supply chain, human capital, the value of human capital um, is always front of mind. And I think that um, actually our vice chair and longtime CFD member Tracy Reese did phenomenal work last year um, during her residency within the fashion initiative uh, in that she completely reset um, after three plus decades in business, which takes you know, so much uh, strategic foresight and, and courage to change everything. And a lot of that focused on the people piece of her organization and then production. Uh, she reshored um, a percentage of her production um, to not only New York, but also to Detroit She's become highly active in that community, chairing the Isaac you know, Innovation Committee, but also working with uh, uh, schools within the community. Um, and that type of leadership uh, is, is so inspiring, I, I think, for, uh, as a staff member, very inspiring to see. But I, I would just emphasize that you know, we never de-strand you know, one part of the conversation, uh, you know, people, environment, uh, you know, human capital. Um, has to be, you know, front of mind. So we always try to um, navigate thinking holistically. I would add to that also um, that the governance portion of it is super important to the the holistic model that I was talking about initially. Is that you know you can't have environmental sustainability without making that your own without making sure that your own internal structures are in order. So a lot of the tools that we have do help uh, brands and retailers deal with that too. Our brand and retail module, for instance, does, you know, it involves the HR department of a company to make sure that there's fair compensation in place, to make sure that there's fair internal governance in place. And that is, that itself is a social risk area that a company can choose to focus on. And so again, you know, we always say at SAC that you can't change what you don't measure. And this is definitely something that needs to be measured in lockstep with the environmental and the social, it's all part of uh, making progress in a sustainable way. Awesome, thank you. So the next question is coming from Donna and she's an independent artisan jewelry brand. So she's wondering what is the best way to market socially responsible positioning? There, you know, I, I think that one of the cool things about brands that are starting out sustainably is the amazing storytelling they can do with how they found their materials or how it's made and the process. And I think that 
people are really excited to hear and learn about um, the products. And, and more than ever, and particularly in jewelry, uh, people want to connect to that brand. So use your story. Tell them you know, how you found your material, how you found your craftsmen, um, what you're doing special for your packaging or um, selling it. And, uh, you know, the beautiful jewelry and a beautiful story is a winning combination. I'll add on that. I, I fully agree. And I think we've jumped over a little hurdle that the apparel, footwear, accessories industry has had, which is particularly for those that are publicly traded and looking at sort of ESG approach towards environmental and social goals. There's, there's been a hesitancy, hesitancy sometimes. Well, if I talk about the good things I'm doing over here, somebody's going to learn about this issue in our supply chain that we haven't yet solved for. And there's been a hesitancy sometimes. You know, it, it's, it's one end or the other. Either we're greenwashing and making a big deal out of something that's not big impact and we're worried we'll get exposed. Or, you know, we're, we're saying, look how great and green we are. And meanwhile, we know we haven't solved for this major issue. I think fortunately the, the apparel sector has been able to move past that. And it is about being authentic and transparent in that tone of saying we have a story to tell because this is an important uh, part of our brand as a whole. The decisions that we make around materials, the decision we make around labor, uh, who we're employing, how we're employing them, where we're sourcing from is part of our ethos, which means it is part of our brand. And it is what increasingly consumers are inspired by and in this sort of, um, I think we're, we're all sort of looking for this holy grail of the next generation to help drive this through consumer demand of we won't buy this stuff, but we'll buy this stuff. And uh, as we lean into that, the storytelling and the marketing of the good decisions that are being made is going to be critical because I think citizens as a whole will be inspired to continue to invest with their own personal dollars or other in other ways with things that that are resonating. And so I just want to echo what Karen said, because I think every uh, brand out there should, if they're doing something good and responsible and they're proud of it, they should attach that to their brand story. I guess my next question, this is not from the audience, this is from me, but I guess as a student, like Kennedy was saying, it's kind of difficult. There's this balance of hope and um, staying positive. Um, do you think from a industry standpoint, do you think that these up and coming brands that are, uh, the sustainability is in their DNA, like we said, do you think that they will be able to financially succeed the huge powerhouses in the industry? Do you think that they have the power to kind of gain that market share and gain that uh, momentum? I don't, I mean, let me say one. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Sarah. Was uh, that? I, I, I do. I mean, I think we're seeing a shift right now in what customers, you know, what they want and what they want to buy um, and where they're buying it from. Some was happening before all of the stores shut down, for sure. And, um, you know, certainly a lot more is happening now. Uh, I think think that we're going to see a lot more specialty brands um, out there and you know maybe they don't become the big mega companies that exist today but I think there's going to be a lot of very healthy and profitable smaller businesses um, and I think that when there's challenging times there's great opportunities and we're seeing people innovatively connect with customers i'm seeing people sell things on facebook and doing live videos and um you know hosting virtual trunk shows and doing them very successfully so uh you know clever those who are clever are going to be able to figure out how to grow and sell their brands and again back to the storytelling piece of it um you know this is a uh, you know, it's just the whole social responsibility piece is so important right now. Um, so yeah, I think tons of opportunity out there. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly what, what I was going to say too, because I think that a lot of the things that the industry has been looking at and investing in are going to get accelerated. I mean, we've almost like jumped forward by, you know, 
don't know how many years, but it's like these were all smart ideas working from home and direct to consumer and over jumping over the, the re traditional retail and going right. You know. But now it's not only a necessity, people are going to be looking for ways in which to kind of expand their own product and product offering or service offering in a faster way. And so when you look at some of the models that big brands were even looking at that were disruptive, like share, repair, circular models, all of a sudden you have this opportunity for smaller brands to have that leadership position. They don't need to be, it doesn't need to be a project inside a big brand. And you, and look at um, personal care products and, and consumer packaged goods and companies that authentically started like Method and Burt's Bees and all in that. Now they are part of larger multinationals, but they started as a disruptor. They started as something different that stole market share from a traditional soap or a traditional face cream. And that's, I think, what we're going to start to be able to see more of and so for any of the young designers or emerging brands or students that are out there listening to this like you got to go for it because you you have the opportunity to disrupt um, the existing models now more than ever and I would also add to that that perhaps the question this is a time where the question itself can be shifted so not just how competition can be changed, but uh, you know, this, there's a real value in a pre-competitive environment now. I think large companies are realizing that they have a lot to learn from smaller companies and small companies have a lot to learn from large companies. So again, you know, within the SAC, we see a lot of this pre-competitive idea sharing and that's really going to move the entire industry forward together, large companies and small companies alike. You know, we've been seeing uh, the industry recovering from the COVID-19 crisis and the other crises that have been unfolding at the same time. And those companies that have put lots of effort behind sustainability initiatives are the ones that have come out stronger at the end. And so if this is something that's a norm within the industry, it will really restore consumers' faith in the industry. And I think all ships can be raised together. So it's really in pre-competitive collaboration, I think, that everyone can succeed. Um, just piggybacking off of what Rebecca was kind of saying um super nice to hear from all of you meet all of you um i we're both super grateful to be a part of this i just want to preface that so thank you all so much and i noticed that travis you had a question in the chat box if you want to go ahead and ask that question feel free to i think i can unmute you all right so i just had a question about um how does the industry deal with the fact that it doesn't have really a sustainable purpose so when it comes down to to being a business it's really all about profit so how does it how does the industry remedy itself and come across as authentic when it really its purpose is to in a sense provide an exclusive um uh exclusionary product that's a great question great question yeah and it reminds me of this, the, the definition of sort of growth is defined by the markets is to create the illusion of scarcity where none exists. And, and I think the fashion industry is, you know, certainly can play into this idea of uh, aspirational uh, and, and how that drives it. But, but then my thought also becomes, is this a moment where, where we get back to the origin of why any of this matters. What is the purpose of textiles? What is the purpose of personal um, statement related to how you adorn yourself, how you um, invest in things that make you feel good, you know, uh, in your home, on your body, et cetera. And I know that sounds a little, you know, uh, a little woo woo, but the reality is I think as a society as a whole, we're rethinking of values across all of these issues that are, we've been talking about today from coronavirus to social justice, Black Lives Matter. We have a moment to really evaluate our values. And if a brand does not in some way or a designer or a product doesn't in some way support our own personal values then do we need it you know is it necessary and i think this darwinistic shakeout of our industry is going to be happening as a result of economics and as a result of access and and um some real significant uh drivers that are stopping you know production and consumption and that's a good thing so that perhaps uh 
you know, the optimist in me thinks maybe we need to get back to why this as an art form and as a personal statement of who we are, you know, matters, and then look at how that also creates livelihood and economic development as a component of it, because we, we want to keep the world employed. And there's a tremendous amount of people out there who can be part of a vibrant, profitable industry, but, but we probably need to rethink why it matters and then build from there. That was great, Lewis. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pull one question from the Q&A box. Um, Liza has a really good question, so I'm going to read it off really quick. I know sustainability focuses on the environmental piece of creating fashion, but does any of the work you do incorporate labor issues facing the fashion industry, such as poor conditions of the factories, abuse of the workers, low pay for hours of work? So I think that she's just kind of asking, what does the other side of that look like? I know that we discuss it's kind of a triangle of ethics, economics, environment. So what does kind of that ethics side look like? Um, I, I can speak to that uh, first. So within the Higgin Index model, the tools, we have uh, tools that measure environmental sustainability and then also social and labor practices. So that is at every step of the way, you know, we're working with manufacturers, we're working with brands, we're working with retailers. Um, we're measuring environmental and social and labor practices at the same time. So it's really important uh, to further sustainability measures, again, to have this idea of this environmental justice, the social and labor practices being monitored, to have those with a continuous pathway for improvement as well, because you really can't have one without the other. Um, and so it's, it's very important in identifying risk areas within a company and to see where the environmental and the social elements of that are and how, again, companies can improve and make sure that they're continuously improving. Excellent, thank you. So I just looked at the time and I'm realizing we're almost out of it. So let's finish with one more question for all of you. And it's going to be a multi-layered question because I'm looking at the chat box. There's some we didn't get to answer. Um, and uh, some I still have. But if you could answer, uh, let's really talk about a solution because I feel that that's what people need. Although, is there ever a solution when every solution creates another problem? Because even, you know, what you talked about, Travis, is that we're ultimately an unsustainable industry as it, as it is modeled on now, right? So if we st stop consuming or producing less, like Lewis said, we put people out of work. And then they have, pe the people in the, that have those jobs have less disposable income to, to spend in their own communities. It's all connected. But if you could each share a solution, either to how a brand can implement a circularity process as be part of the circular economy or how a brand can um, uh, do something with all of the inventory they may still be sitting on because of COVID or um, any other thing that you suggest that a brand can start and do in terms of sustainability where it's not gonna cost them a lot because there's always someone at the table at least when I work with brands, who says that. It just can't cost me loads, right? You know, we can't, it can't. So either something that, the, a place they can start that does, that does have a quick ROI um, or circularity or selling model with this inventory. Any of those, so please. And this will be our last question. So we probably only have about a minute or so each. I'll go first and invite um, those who haven't seen it again to go to CFA.com. We did a toolkit in partnership with NYU Stern Center for Sustainability last spring, and it was really rather a quick wins toolkit uh, that designers and small brands can use as examples of like, you know, uh, uh, easy, intermediate, or advanced actionable steps you can take. So it really distills down some key strategies. Um, a lot of them relate to, to you know, materials or to product, but it kind of at very least gives you some road, you know, very tangible, like, oh, here's what I can do. And hopefully you can build upon that. I'm a big personal proponent of, um, you know, building on the discussion around, you know, the, the, the pipeline of, of new SMEs and that they're building, you know, they're always agile. That's the benefit of being smaller. You have um, ingenuity and agility on your side. But looking for ways to think beyond product, you know, in your value proposition or creation, um, you know, in other sectors for many years, um, there's been a service shift. And I think it's exciting that fashion is um, also looking at opportunities to have combined product service offerings or experiential offerings, because I believe, as Lewis was saying, you know, we do want brands to be 
financially profitable, but also socially and environmentally conscious. And sometimes it does come down to looking for revenue opportunities that are, you know, maybe less product based, but um, that's just an opinion. <laughs> That's a great toolkit that you came out with last year. And Lois, your friend Domenica Peterson worked on that too, right? Thank yeah. you. Yes. Um, oh. I'll, I'll jump in and piggy, piggyback on that note. I think, I think you know, getting started, um, figuring out where you are on your journey. I mean, if you're, if you're, you've been paying attention and you've been part of the conversations and all, then you're ready to like dive into some impact projects and. Uh, and if you're new to this, then it's like you get interested and get engaged in the organizations we all represent. You can you can sort of plug into because we're all doing work. We're making transparent and available uh, out there. Um, and then I'd say in terms of picking a specific activity, you know, it's really, I think, to authentically attach your interest to what you want if materials are it for you and you are in love with materials then go after materials work with textile exchange work with some of the work that's been identified by cfda if you are really a climate activist going after climate and you want to reduce it in your supply chain come to aii work with sac and the film you know so i think it's i think for this to be successful everybody needs to plug into the piece of this that makes them most passionate and alive because that's where you're going to have most fun doing it and the reality is you could go in a thousand directions and they're all going to be positive impact, but you know, go where you feel the most driven. Yeah, and absolutely. I would agree with that and say that it's really important for those at the beginning of the journey to understand that they don't have to tackle everything at once. So there's a lot of work to do out there, uh, but if you bite off more than you can chew, none of it's going to get done. So what we've seen, uh, you know, using the Hig Index over the last couple of years is that so many elements of a product lifecycle are interconnected. So if a company, as Lewis said, can find one area of the process that they're really passionate about and one piece where they can start, that will often reveal several other places where there's already a building block in progress for them to work with. So, you know, as I said earlier, you can't change what you're not measuring. So start by looking at where you have data and dive in there. So whether you're starting to map your supply chain and see what you can do with that, whether you're doing a social or an environmental risk assessment and seeing where your hotspots are and where you can already improve, whether you're uh, using a tool like the HIG Material Sustainability Index to map your materials portfolio and see what your emissions look like as connected to your materials, you know, you can start somewhere, but I think the message really is that you do have to do something because it's crucial to the survival of, of the industry and to any company to, to do something and to get started and look to the long run. The exciting thing right now is there's so many educational opportunities out there, like the series you're doing. Everybody that's here is already taking a step and in investing in learning more. And, um, you know, fortunately, there's a lot out right now that doesn't cost anything um, to, to just learn about. And I think uh, someone mentioned it, but every little step counts. If you can't fully transform your company right now, you know, and you can take little tiny steps, um, it, it does make a difference. Uh, so, you know, even if it's not something that you feel like you can, you know, raise a flag about and start to talk to your consumers, it, it might just be a tweak in your packaging that saves, um, you know, that saves a lot of money or, or reduces waste. Um, they, it all adds up. So you got to start somewhere. Um, and if it's a small step, it's a good step. The inventory thing, um, nobody answered. So I'll answer that. We are seeing some really creative solutions to um, inventory. I, I, one of the ones I was most excited about, we saw a big brand um, make a large donation to a charity called Delivering Good that um, you know, gives it to people that are in need. Um, and some of these brands who are starting to make donations like that are not brands that you would have traditionally seen uh, donate their product. Um, I, my heart was warmed when I read that article about the size of that kind of donation. So we're starting to see some um, you know, really innovative uh, solutions to um, you know, what they have on hand. And I think going forward, um, you know, what we're certainly seeing is more modest orders. So um, I don't, th I think people are mainly just ordering to, um, you know, producing to what's ordered. So hopefully there'll be less 
inventory around um, to clog up the system going, going ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Esther Lewis, Karen, and um, Sarah. Where is Sarah? Oh, okay, I miss Sarah. Okay, Amy from uh, LIN, take it away. So first I wanna thank Esther, Lewis, Karen, and Sarah for participating in today. Everybody was wonderful and incredibly informative. And I think for those that are watching today, there's some really great messages just to summarize here in that if you're a small business owner, you're a brand owner, big, large businesses, or just a learner of sustainability and sustainability in terms of practices, it was really incredibly exciting to hear how each of your organizations is really taking on a collaborative approach within the industry and supporting each other within the industries, but also a progressive approach in educating the industry. And, and I think what's very important for so many here that are listening today is there's so many tools and resources that each of these organizations provide and a community. And that's really a very important part of what's happening. And we really, as a community, not just from a college and an educator's perspective, but from an industry perspective, that we need to support each other through this journey. And I think, Andrea, you said it very well. It's, it's really a journey. It's not a sprint. And um, there's so many exciting things here for people to really latch on to. And thank you all again so much. I'd like to turn this over to Monica. And Monica has a few words to say before we close out. Oops, just trying to wait for load. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Ecolife Yarns, Kendor Textiles, and the Accessories Council. If anybody's interested in becoming a sponsor, please reach out to myself, Juana, or Gladys. You can find our email and information at fashiondex.com. I also wanted to mention that coming up on July 21st, Local Loft at Text World will be having the virtual edition. Uh, is the sourcing event of the summer. You can find the information at fashiondex.com forward slash register now at uh, HTML. Uh, also, this was brought to you by Fashiondex and LIM College. Fashiondex is the publisher of the Fashion Designer Sustainable Source Book, and the latest edition is available at fashiondex.com forward slash store. Finally, I would like to invite you to uh, join us next week, week three. We're going to be having a conversation on sustainability and sourcing with local and domestic suppliers. The lead moderator is Sue Papas of JS Group. Co-moderator will be Austin Sierra, an LIN, uh, LIN college student. Our speakers will be David M. Prentice of On Point Manufacturing, Jessica Osborne of Privy Label, Davia Lumba of Eagle Fabrics, Anna Livermore of Vimora, Jenny Side of InStyle Exchange, and we hope you will join us. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>